Hello and welcome to Jim Dalton's presentation, How to Trade Using Odds-Based Thinking. It's March 17th, Thursday, currently 12 p 12.01 p.m. Eastern. We'll go for about an hour, maybe a little more to get the questions in. This webinar is being recorded. will be available at jdaltontrading.com under Resources, Webinars, Recorded Webinars, not long after we complete. Actually, it may be a little bit. We'll see where that goes, but it will be up there soon enough. Um, also, we have dragged the slides from today's webinar um, to the handout section of GoToWebinar, but sometimes some people can download them from there, some can't, so we have it at jdaltontrading.com as well under Resources, Webinars, Upcoming Webinars, and this will be the uh, top post, and the slides are right there for you. Okay, um, Jim and I want to thank you all. It's great to see you. Thank you for taking time out of your day to spend it with us and give us the opportunity to share Jim's work with you. Um, it's always great to see new names, which I'm seeing here, and older, more familiar names. So thank you. It means a lot to us, and we appreciate it. Um, this is the, the second in a series of six webinars, so please check out other webinars at upcomingwebinars.com, uh, upcomingwebinars at jdaltontrading.com. We're going to have Tuesday, Thursday webinars for the remainder of the month. And we got a lot uh, teed up, so if you'd like to uh, join in, the links are there at our site. And with that, I think I'm done. I'm going to hand it over to Jim. Hi, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Odds-based trading. I start with – let me make sure I've got the right order here. Okay, somehow um, I didn't realize, I should have checked, we are uh, missing a slide. Um, so let Jim, me talk. Hang, hang with me one minute, everyone. I'm going to shoot those to you in an email. I'm, I'm sorry, this is my mistake. Okay. Give me one quick minute. Don't know how that happened, but things happen. There you go, sir. It's on its way. Okay. Okay, let's try one more time. No, we're still missing a slide. Um, okay, here's what's, what's missing. I don't know how that happened. I'm very, very sorry. The, where we start with this, and I'm going to back up this so it doesn't confuse you. Um, if you're taking notes, I always start with looking at the monthly bar. From a monthly bar standpoint, is the auction... Are we, are we moving one time framing higher? Are we moving one time framing lower? We look at the monthly bar. Are we moving, you know, on a balancing basis where, you know, one high takes it goes higher, the next month goes lower, so you're moving sideways. Hey, Jim. That's always, always, yes. Excuse me. I sent them again. I don't know what's going on. They're right on my end, but maybe I saved them. I resaved them if you want to grab them. I think everyone okay. has the correct slides if they're using them, but, you know, for presentation's okay. sake. Sorry about that, everyone. No, nope, still not there. 
Um, okay. Let me let me go on with what I'm talking about. I don't know what happened I, here. I see it on the thumbnails when I look on your side rail. I don't know. That's so bizarre. It's on the side of the, oh. all the, the thumbnails of the slides. I see trend. Um, I don't know how to get to it. Let's see. Do I minimize this? Just escape. You see that trend right there? Do from current okay. slide. Just go from current slide up above. Yeah. And down, okay. down arrow, and it should work. That's bizarre. Okay. So I, I start, what I'm always looking for is, do we have a trend? The most powerful thing that you're ever going to deal with in understanding what's going on with the market is a trend. And this is going to depend upon your time frame. So I start with the long-term trend. When I look at the market, do I have an indication using the monthly bar of a long-term trend, uh, you know, in either direction. Then I look next and I go and see, do I have a trend in the intermediate term? So the strongest market, you'd have a, a long-term trend up, you'd have an intermediate term trend up, and then you'd have a short-term trend up. So that would be your strongest situation. Next, you'd have a long-term, you have a long-term trend, and you could have the long-term trend up, the intermediate term trend down and a short term trend up. So you can have any combination in there. But I start with the long term trend and what I want to know, whatever trend I'm working with, is that trend you are focusing on young or old? If a long term trend using the monthly bar is young, you will see that it's one time frame higher or Occasionally, there may be one month that takes out the previous month low, but overall, you see a nice upward slope if it's going higher or a downward slope if it's going lower. So that's always where I start. And, it's all, and the reason for this, it's very difficult to fight trends. When you're talking about odds, and the odds are always against you when you're fighting a trend. Now, of course, it, it depends on what your time frame is. Then we look at the intermediate term trend. Is the intermediate term trend up or is the intermediate term trend down or balancing? For example, currently I have the long term trend up. The long term trend ends in an intermediate term trend. In other words, as we've said before, we do not go from long term trend up to long term trend down. Very rarely. Generally goes long term trend up, balance. That balance from the long term trend is the intermediate term trend. And it's very easy to have a long term trend up. And then when that tires, you start to get an intermediate term trend to the downside. So it would be consistent for you to say the long term trend is up, the intermediate term trend is down. Then it's going to depend on your time frame how you look at that. You're also going to ask yourself, is the intermediate term trend young or old? Let me go back for a second. If the intermediate term trend is still one time framing higher on a monthly basis or very close to it with a nice slope, then it is generally young, even if it has been around for a substantial period of time. If the long-term trend begins to show where it would go up and then it moves sideways for a couple of months and then it moves up again like a stair step and you can draw a pencil line at least between the high of the lower distribution and the low of the new upper distribution of the two month balance your trend is fairly young the long term trend is showing signs of age when the balance period, so that stair step when the top step starts to overlap the previous um, two months moving sideways balance. So that's a, just an indication of the trend is aging. And then you've got the intermediate term trend. Intermediate term trend, you're going to measure more by using a combination of monthly and weekly bars. And you're going to see is there a trend to the intermediate term. So along, for example, right now, 
currently in our market, the long-term trend is up and the intermediate term trend is up. The long-term trend is up. The market then broke down to the 1800 level. That was the intermediate term trend, took it down to the 1800 level. We were touch and go for a period of time. And I had written and said just a little bit more and the intermediate term trend would have morphed into a long-term trend. So we would have gone long-term trend up, balance, long-term trend down. But we didn't. We long-term trend is up. We got an intermediate term trend to the downside, got down to the 1800, and it turned around. So we are still in long-term trend is up and balancing. Intermediate term trend is up. Currently, the short-term trend is up, as we've seen. Um, the, the short term trend is up um, as we've seen for the last several days and now we go again today and we see that the daily trend is up. Let's see, let's pull up the um, hold on, let me get down here for a second and okay here we have the uh, ESM6. I'm going to start with the yearly, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to start with the monthly bar. I'm going to make this just a little smaller if I can. Okay, let's see, I'm trying to make this a little smaller. I'm just trying to get this a little bit smaller. I'll be just a second. Okay, here's your here's your monthly bar. When I was talking about the long-term trend up, this is what a long-term trend looks like. As you can see, you got one one month that took out the previous months, but then the market continued higher. Notice right here, which goes back to um, April of 14, there's a high, and the market still went higher. But then you see a few months later, in October, the market broke to the downside. This, at the time, what I wrote at the time, this is more than likely the beginnings of the intermediate term trend. Notice. <clears throat> that the balance, the market tries to balance again up here, but see how it overlaps this higher balance? So that's a sign that the market is, doesn't mean it's over. But when this balance, this three month balance overlaps this prior period, that's a sign that the trend is aging. Look down here, the market's going higher. Here's the next balance and there's no overlap in here. So this is still a pretty young market. A little bit of overlap here, getting a little tighter. Now you're getting some serious overlap, and then you have more here. So at this point in time, the long-term trend is tiring. It continues higher until it moves sideways. So it goes into the balance. So and we said, remember, we go long-term trend up, balance, then intermediate-term trend. So and our intermediate-term trend turns to the downside. It didn't quite take out this low. And this right in here is when I was talking about, are we to the point where we're going to morph into a long-term trend? And we didn't. So the long-term trend now is up and balancing. The intermediate-term trend was down. So the intermediate-term was down. Intermediate-term trend was up. Intermediate-term trend was down. Intermediate-term trend is now up. So that's so we're looking at, that's how we kind of go through this entire analysis. Now once I've got, I can then go and I can start to look at the weekly to refine it just a, a little more. You can see this is our, this is our um, low, this is when the intermediate term trend turned back to the upside and as you can see we are one time framing higher 
on a weekly basis since this low was established. We in here yesterday, this actually think this gap was actually filled. It doesn't show on the on these charts, but I think it was filled yesterday. So right now, the, sh the intermediate term trend is up. Now let's go take a look, that's the weekly, let's look at the daily. And we see that the daily trend, let me make this just a little bit bigger if we can. The daily trend is showing a little different picture. Here's the daily trend right here. Here's a breakout. Here's a breakout. And notice that the next area where the market moves sideways is considerably above the last sideways or little balance area. The market rallies, moves sideways, kind of a stair step. But notice the current movement sideways. Overlap, overlap. We're overlapping these last several days. When I look at this way, it appears to me that the shorter term trend is getting very tired. So the, the, this is the intermediate term trend is up. Within the intermediate term trend, we've had a short term trend down, a short term trend up, a short term trend down. Now the short term trend is back up. But notice the overlap. So more than likely, this is getting tired. That doesn't mean that it's over. Okay? It doesn't mean that it's over. But let's go back to the title of what we're talking about. From an odds-based thinking point of view, it is getting tired. And the odds of substantial upside continuation from here have decreased substantially. The odds of a correction have improved. The market is now trying to break above this small level right here, which is about the 2015 level. Notice it did it one day, it came back in, and we're, you know, overnight, and we're back up here again. So the long-term trend is currently up and balancing. Intermediate-term trend is up. Short-term trend is up and tiring. The short-term trend probably also indicates that the intermediate-term trend is getting tired at this point. Let me take any questions just on what I have talked about on looking at trend. This has to be specifically referred to the S&Ps. However, it's applicable to any market. The principles we talk about are applicable to, applicable to any market. Questions on what we have talked about so far, Julia? Yes, thank you. So the, this is Judy asking, so the longer term trend or intermediate term trends are not monthly or weekly moving averages, it is the overlapping bars you're using? Absolutely. I do not use moving averages. And the problem with moving averages is they're price-based. And, you know, that doesn't mean that I disregard them. But I find that looking at the market this way has been far more meaningful to me uh, than using moving moving averages. Um, and I say they're mainly because they're, they're price-based. This isn't perfect either. This is silly, only one dimension. Uh, it's just something that I have that I have observed over many, many years. Okay? Other questions? Good question. Thank you. Okay, Michael here is asking, is the fact that the balances are overlapping the only indication of the market being tired that you watch for? Oh, no, absolutely not. We're going to go into more detail in a minute. And it's like I say, I start with the daily, I'm with the monthly, daily, and weekly bars in order to get a broader perspective. And after I'm done with that, then I go into the profiles, which are three-dimensional, to get a more of a microscopic view of what is really going on underneath the surface. So it's a good question. That is the latter part of our uh, presentation today. We just keep going down from larger perspective and we keep going down to finer and finer detail. The reason I start from the top down is to give me a large perspective and fit the smaller pieces into that puzzle. Too many people start with the, the very small uh, bottoms up, minute discussion of what's going on in the current day, and that can 
very often block your perception of what is really going on in the market. I just find I'm better to start from the top down, then I come down and then I decide what are my tactics for my time frame, and then I come down and I look at the smaller information and decide what I want to do from a tactical uh, trading standpoint. Good question. Thank you. Okay, and Pedro, thank you for asking this. Great. Um, are you using day in pit session only bars or um, after hours in your bar charts? The, to the best that I can get, I use pit session. I find, and the reason I use pit session uh, is because it's available. Obviously, if you're trading the currencies, you don't have that same, you don't know, have that available to you. If I'm trading pit sessions, I have a ten, uh, currencies that don't have, you know, the pit sessions. I tend to use uh, the best I can the hours when a currency traded relative to the New York uh, opening uh, times and closes. I find that the best source of information comes from trading that takes place during New York hours. Um, years ago when I was with UBS Financial Services, the institutional desk moved the order book from New York to Asia to London back to the U.S., thinking that you know trading was 24 hours a day. That didn't last very long. They found that there was still better the better information was during the time that the New York was open because we were still a primary market. That may change over time. I still find it's fairly applicable. Okay? Okay. Other questions? You, yeah, Kevin's asking here, do you use volume with the monthly, weekly, daily analysis? No, I do not. I, I, will, I look at the individual profiles. I don't look at it on a monthly basis. Um, in or order to use or weekly basis. I do on a daily basis. They, what I want to be sure of is if I'm going to use volume, I have to make sure I know what the direction was for that month, week, etc. And that, a lot of times it's not totally clear. The market may open higher and the month come back down and then close higher. Volume can be very misleading unless you know what the market was trying to do when that volume occurred. Good question. Thank you. How does Jim reconcile odds-based trading of these trends with the fact that a trend may be carried forward in the S&P when it's trading off another market, as it is with crude today? Remember, this is odds-based trading, and they're just that. They're odds. Let me show you um, something here, just a second. You may have seen, if you're a client, you saw last weekend that we wrote that this was looking like it had pretty good odds of getting a non-linear break or the firecracker effect. The firecracker effect suggests that the market's gotten overdone and it can take out multiple lows. As you can see, in two days' time, this did clear up all of these poor lows. It didn't get these, but it did get those. So the odds, were, in one basis, looking at it, the odds were that this market was getting way overdone and was for a correction. We got the correction, and once we got the correction, the market then moved higher. So again, we're looking at the the trend was up. The trend was up since you know about the same time we made the low. But then we got a counter trend, but I'm also looking at the odds of that counter trend. So now we're back to the upside. On the S&Ps, th remember this went on for some time before this broke. The S&Ps right now are moving higher based upon crude, or a lot of it based upon crude. Does that make me very suspect? Yes, it does. But again, there's another thing we look at, and that's completion to an auction. So do I think now that the S&Ps are tiring? Yes. Do I think the odds are correction? I think they're high. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen today. This took some period of time. We do take that into effect. But even though 
as you'll see when we get into more detail here in a minute, uh, and if you are a client, you saw last night's report, the last, not yesterday, but the three days, three days prior to yesterday, the S&Ps were trying to trade higher and volume declined each day. And that looked to us like that was, um, that lack of volume said there was a dangerous situation. Uh, now the, S the, F the uh, crude went up, the F FOMC came out last night or yesterday, and the market continues to rally. However, with a pretty big rally and break overnight, if the market really strong, I don't think you get that kind of volatility. But we'll move on to that uh, as we get into the more specific uh, items on our graphics. Another two questions, and then I'm going to move on. Can as few as two daily bars qualify as a trend? That's a great question. Or and you didn't say daily. Pardon me, Bill. Go ahead. Let me go back to our, so we can have a daily trend. So you could certainly, you could have a, da a daily trend, but if you have, if the two bars are one higher, let's say it's a trend, yes, that could be high. That could be a part of a trend, up or down. Two daily bars that overlapped, we would consider to be short-term balance. And we have a, we will discuss balance uh, as we go on. Just as when we went back, and I'm going back to the ES here in a minute. Okay, when we're back here, this is balance. When you look across this low, even though this is several months, the principles of balance are applicable to any time frame. In this case, we had 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 month balance. And we said at this lower level, which would have been, if you take this low right here, it depends on what you, but we said balanced trading rules apply. The balanced trading rules are as follows. Either remain within balance, if you remain within balance, then you're probably going to see rotation within the balance area. Look below balance and accelerate. So let's go up here. Here's on an intermediate term. Here's one, two, three, four. There's five months of balance. Look below balance and accelerate. This is an example of the market. Look below balance and accelerated lower. Or over here, we were using this 18-month period as balance and said, look below balance. And the third rule, look below balance and fail. In this case, we look below balance and fail. It wasn't pretty. It was a little hard to read. But look below balance and accelerate. This was look below balance and fail. And now the market is moving higher. That same principle that you see on a monthly bar, it is applicable to an inside is going down as low as a single inside bar. 30-minute inside bar on the daily profile. It's applicable to two overlapping 30-minute bars. It's applicable to two overlapping individual days, two overlapping individual months, weeks, days, etc. So the principle of balance is applicable. Uh, is, uh, it's, it's, it's in play for any balance, no matter what time period. The point that I'm trying to make here is that the principles we talk about are the same no matter what time frame you are trading, the shortest time frame or the longest time frame. They are very important. The two most important concepts we deal with are excess and balance. Excess marks the end of one rate, one auction, and the beginning of a new auction. Balance when you come out of balance, that is also an extremely important consideration because when you come out of balance, that starts a new auction. Now, 
I have questions about the current auction, even though the current auction, intermediate auction is to the upside, I have questions about that staying power over time because we never really had any clear excess down here. So I have, the question I have, was this auction completed to the downside? Okay, let me go back to the graphics. So we've talked about, you know, is the trend young or old? We've got some idea how we look at the, how we look at that. Young, just to review it, uh, recent excess or breakout, the two most important concepts we deal with. Excess we covered. Failure to see excess tells you the odds are low that there is completion to the current auction. This is applicable to the monthly lows at 1800 that we never saw uh, excess down there. Now, it may be that it's going to happen that way. It certainly can, but it's, it raises a question. And then it's dependent on your time frame. New auction begins when the market comes out of balance. As I said earlier, that can be a single inside bar. It can be two 30-minute bars, three 30-minute bars, two overlapping days, etc. But those are very, very important principles. Balance tells you that the current trend has come into balance. That's all it is. If, even so, if it's a daytime frame auction, remember in a daytime frame auction up, we're saying the market's always looking for a place where two-sided trade can occur. And if all of a sudden you start to get overlapping ba uh, bars, that is short, very short-term balance, and it's allowing for two-sided trade to, uh, to take place. The components incorporated in odds-based thinking include Structure, overall structure, shape, elongated, truncated, POC migrating higher with price or not, includes excess. So there's a lot of components. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some of those individual components. Uh, is there a couple of questions before I go to the next slide, Julia? Well, let's just see. Um... We did have a request to talk about crude today. I don't know if we'll have time, Judy, but I hear you. Um, last trade date for March is tomorrow. Does your March contract, does your volume analysis take that into consideration? No, because I don't use futures volume. I use the, the New York Stock Exchange composite volume. That I consider to be my best source of information. So I'm not dependent upon the volume on the individual futures contract. Okay, great. Uh, does the lack of excess on the monthly charts when the intermediate term auction was down give you a hint that we're, we're not going lower? No, as I just said, it, 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 the, uh, I think the market got terribly, terribly short. And remember, a lack of excess, well, you won't remember because unless you've been with us for a period of time. Excess, lack of excess sometimes is an indication of a market that gets too short if there's lack of excess on the lower end or too long if it gets, um, you know, no excess on the upper end. Um, but the, uh, the lack of excess on the monthly bar makes me question if we really have an, uh, a lasting intermediate term auction to the upside. If we have an intermediate term auction to the upside, then we've got a good chance to go to the all-time highs. Because a lot of times when you fail at one end, the destination trade becomes the opposite extreme of the trading range, the opposite extreme of the recent intermediate term auction to the downside would be the all-time highs, the upper end of that trading range. Uh, I think the odds are fairly low that that's going to happen, and part of it because we didn't have clear excess on the bottom. It looked to me like we had a market that got too short, and then we really started to get some short covering. But we're going to look more closely at the individual days here. Okay? What do you think about today's trend day? Mike is asking this in comparison to the market being tired. No, I'm not there yet. I, I will okay. get there before we okay, before we end this. Thanks, Mike. Okay. When we are, somebody asked a question about volume earlier. What we're saying, are higher prices cutting off activity? Slideshow. Are higher prices, pardon? Slideshow, current slide. It's small for them. Okay. Thank you. Are higher prices cutting off activity? 
or a higher price is bringing in more activity. Are lower prices cutting off or more prices bringing in more activity? Remember, I, the, the comment I made, the last three days the markets tried to move higher and higher prices have cut off activity. And that's important to the odds-based thinking. Now remember, odds-based thinking is just that. That doesn't mean that the market's got to go down. It just means that when you look overall, you say this isn't a very healthy auction. Now we've got crude oil been taking this market higher, but it's the market, what bothers me about the market, it's not going higher on its own. Take this market higher and crude going down, I say, hey, we got something here. But the market's being pulled higher by crude and weak hands traders, I think, but we're not seeing higher volume. And that is an end, that's an alert to me that the risk of being long is getting excessive. You know, higher prices are cutting off activity. If you had the market going higher and you had an increase in volume, now you're saying that's pretty healthy. The more the higher prices go, the more volume that the market is attracting. So you're getting more and more people coming off the sidelines, joining into the market and taking it higher. That is a very healthy sign. When you go to an auction, and remember, we always talk about this being, the auction being a two-way two continuous process. When you go to an auction, the auction may start off, you know, say you got 100, I got 105, I got 110, and all of a sudden, you hear the auctioneers start to put in filler. Who will give 107.50 for this, blah, blah, blah. The more filler he's putting in, the greater the odds are that the auction is slowing, that activity, its market goes higher, there's less and less bids coming into the market. Other times, you may hear the auction, we got, we got 107,000, and all of a sudden, you may hear the auctioneer say, new bidder, which means new bidders are entering the process. So higher prices are taking activity higher, not cutting it off. The expected, the expected thing anytime you raise prices, the expected re results is for raising of prices to cut off activity. If you get the unexpected, then the odds are that we're going, so if higher prices instead of cutting off activity are bringing in more activity, that is not economically what normally happens. But that tells you that we're probably going higher. It's a very strong auction and that auction probably has a long way to go. So again, that's where volume figures into the whole to the whole process. Um, and to give you a, an example that I remember from some years ago, people are waiting to buy homes because the Federal Reserve keeps uh, lowering rates and they keep waiting until they're going to get the you know the best rate they can. And all of a sudden comes along and interest rates rise. Well, theoretically, when interest rates rise, that should have come off activity. It didn't. What it did, it brought in more and more activity because now people that have been waiting, that pent up demand, were waiting and all of a sudden they saw, uh oh, you know, rates are going to higher, I better come in now. So you saw higher prices bringing in more and more activity. And we see this in the markets all the time. This happens when we see a, a breakout from balance. You get a breakout from balance and all of a sudden it's bringing in more activity. That is a very good sign that the market's going higher. And of course, the same thing, it's the mirror image on the, uh, on the downside. Can I uh, interject a question or you want to keep going? No, no, go ahead. All right, Merritt's asking, what specific ways does Jim measure this volume activity to see if it's being cut off or not? I do it a day at a time. The, in 30 the last, minutes at a time at the training site. At the, yes, but we, we look at, at the training site. You'll see the, the composite volume. You can go and get the composite volume based upon the NYSE. And so if you have a day, and let me go to the recent, uh, recent markets here.
you only use volume when you know the attempted direction. So on the 11th, attempted direction was up, volume declined. 14th, attempted direction was up, volume declined. On the 15th, attempted direction was up, volume declined again. Overnight activity went higher, but the market was the market was low open the following day lower. Then external factors arrived in here, and we got the crude oil and the FOMC, and you can see the market. This is yesterday. The market breaks to the upside, and you know crude is continuing to pull it higher today, from what I can you know from what I can see, and so this is a these are the type of things why we say they're only odds. But when I look at this and I see that the volume on the upside has been lower, has has come in lower, that makes me very suspicious that there's good odds of upside continuation, and it seems to me to raise the odds that it may not be too long before we start to trade back down. But remember, that is it's only odds. And so Sometimes, as you saw in the crude oil, it took a couple of weeks, but then you got a break that took back all, it took back five days in, in one or two days. But we're going to come back and be more specific. But your question is, we look and say, you know, tempted direction was up and volume declined. Structure comes in too. We'll look at that too in a minute. Okay, next question. Um, to clarify, Merit's asking declined relative to the previous day or some moving average? Declined relative to the previous day. And then things are relative too. Like for example, yesterday saw an increase in volume, but the increase in volume was minor relative to what we've been seeing in the last you know month or so. I think we stayed under four billion yesterday on the NYSE composite. Um, so that was still relatively low, and I so I put that in the danger zone again. Now you got you know you got crude last night making new highs, uh, etc. And I think that had a lot to do with you know what's going on in these in these markets. And those those things happen. One of the things it's not part of today's uh, presentation, but one of the things that we talk about consistently is that what traders want to see. They would like to see more consistency in the market. They'd like to have the market be more understandable, et cetera. And the point that we make is there's far more randomness in the world than we want to believe. So all of a sudden, what was it? Not too long ago, we had crude under $25. Now we got crude at $40. I mean, you really think that that changed $15 takes place, eh, that there's really that much change, so much of the randomness and the trading that takes place, and that is impacting our short-term effects on the market. So that those things have to be factored in. But from an overall view, what I see in the current volume is that the days when the market has been trying to go higher have been relatively, they've been actual low uh, volume days, three days in a row. Yesterday was relatively low. Today looks a little higher, but it's also leading into an exp options expiration and quadruple whipping, witching. So it, that can have some impact too. But I'm going to guess overall that the risk is increasing of being long from an odds-based standpoint. But remember, it's just that. It's odds-based. And sometimes somebody's going to draw out on you. Okay. Yes, Jim. Um, could you? Michael's asking, can you? Um, what you consider to be low or high New York Stock Exchange volume? Could you just show the intensive site with that volume read, just that you're eyeballing it day to day, um, and also just the slide presentation, so it's large enough for people. Okay. First but if of you go me... to the the site just quickly, you won't be able to do slideshow while you do that. So it's really a relative day-to-day -day comparison, Michael, really eyeballing it over the last five or six days. And having done that all year, you just get a, a sense. Jim's not um, uh, I'm on, I'm on the new. Uh, I'm on this new computer, so I um, 
I didn't get there immediately. If you just type training, it'll come up because you've already gone to it. You must have gone on to it in Firefox or something. Here, I should be able to get it right here. Okay. So this will give you a visual, Michael. This is how we look at the at the volume, and and you go back, you can go back here, and you can see the different days, and you see the total. But that's how we that's we we track that, and you can spend some time in the in the site and see what we do. I pay the most attention. I pay the most attention to what has occurred in the last ten days. I mean, I'm looking overall in the last 30, 40 days. What I don't do, what I absolutely don't do is go and do a regression analysis on the, uh, from the beginning, you know, using large uh, sample size of, uh, of data. And, and the, reason I, the reason I don't do that is because markets, markets change considerably. And it's the atmosphere of what's currently going on that becomes the most important. Okay. Jim, um, can you compare today's volume versus the attempted direction? Mike says. Yes. Oh, sure. Because if you take a look, today's volume. Okay. The, there's the low. The market. That's. Let me put. Uh, Maybe take June those time there. templates out. Okay. Okay. There's. There's the low today. The market's been one time framing higher uh, all day long. So attempted direction is up because the low was made very early. So the, and it's one time frame higher. So we'll look at the volume at the end of the day. Uh, remember, there may be a different skew to it today because of the fact that it is um, quadruple witching tomorrow. And that can have an impact. That can have an impact on the, uh, on the markets. Okay. Let me go back. And I want to bring this down. I mean, it's hard to do is all the stuff we look at in such a short period of time. But we components we look at, when we start to get to the finer period, uh, look at what we're looking at, poor highs, poor lows, weak highs, weak lows, and then the what we call exponential thinking, which is really where you're putting a lot of factors together and kind of weaving a pattern. For those that may be joining us for the first time, a poor high would be a day that the market had no excess on the high. In other words, there was no single print selling tail on the profile. It would be a poor high. A weak high would be where it was mechanically just a tick or two away from a very mechanical reference. And you'll see that when we go to the chart here in a minute. We, that's very important considerations. Is, and we use these to understand who is in the market, who is in the market, and who are we competing against. When it's coming to exact lows, exact references, exact highs, or you know, levels, it's usually an indication that it is very short-term trading money. And this is the most fickle of funds. Long-term buyers, or what we call sticky money buyers, or institutional buyers, or sellers, you don't see them acting, being active at exact points. They've got too much size to do to try and be that exact. But let's take this in a little more detail. This is, I'm, I'm just going to show you some of the things that we look at. This is yesterday's profile. The current trading range, low, is 1995.50. There's only two ticks of excess on that low. That two ticks of excess indicates to me that this is probably a very weak low. It also, whoops, Okay, how do I get back there? Current slide, yeah. OK, 
Okay, and it's also it could be pretty weak because notice it's only two ticks filled the gap by ticks, and it hasn't been taken out. Now, let me put this a different perspective. Coming into yesterday, and the FOMC meeting, what we noted was you had both a poor or a questionable low, two ticks, and your high coming into yesterday was only two or three ticks for this trading range. So neither of those was very impressive. The short-term auction remained up. The, you know, the, the, the auction, the intermediate-term auction has been up. Short-term auction is up and balancing, but the overall trend has been up. So this was very questionable. It was this auction really completed. We're saying, is this short-term auction completed? I, I'm going to guess not. But this was also questionable. So what happened? The market came back up and took that out yet in the day, late in the day, because it really wasn't completed. It wasn't like there was really, at that level, sellers came in uh, with a meaningful determination. So when we put these pieces together, two ticks of excess, very questionable. Yesterday's low. It took out the early the early morning open by two ticks, and it left two ticks. So it's a weak daily low because it was only two ticks below the opening, very mechanical, and so it's a weak low, only two ticks of excess. So you get what we call exponential. You start to put together multiple pieces of information that add up. Then you've got a prominent point of control yesterday, or a very fat. Fairest price at which business is being conducted, it was exceeded following the FOMC, and the FOMC, you know, meeting had a a, a, a lot of influence on the market. I, I don't, and I, I suspect the biggest things were that they uh, they said they weren't going to uh, they were going to slow down instead of four rate hikes, probably two rate hikes. So what happens with that? The dollar the dollar goes down. Dollar goes down, oil oil goes up because they like the lower down. A lot of trading going on in this in this market. So then you got, and sometimes this will be what we call forcing action. Forcing action occurs when there's a lot of short covering, or just people doing things emotionally. So when I put these pieces together, I think this is questionable. This is questionable. This point of control, we did not come back and revisit today. Today, this morning, we'll see when we go and look at today's market, the the low for this morning was one tick, I believe it was one tick above this <coughs> low of the upper distribution. <coughs> Again, a very, very mechanical reference. Brings it, makes it very suspect to me. Also, yesterday, the K and L L period came down to only one tick above K, also makes that questionable. So this all looked pretty questionable, and when you start to add these things up, the odds say that the market is fairly weak, and the risk of being long is fairly high. Now, that's interesting because you're seeing today, you say, well, what do I need this for, Jim? Because the market is higher today, you know, and it's quite a bit higher. But those things will happen. But they set up in the future, you've got to be fairly questionable in saying, what may be just around the corner in the next week or so? Because this market is not on a strong base or foundation. What would be a stronger base? That, whoops, I don't know why that did that. Um, So say, let's say, what would be a stronger picture that say, hey, I'm pretty comfortable with this market going up. I think the odds are pretty good. We continue higher for some time. You would have had a better low down here. It wouldn't have been exactly matching where the gap was filled or within a couple of ticks. It wouldn't have had to be that exact. It may have been down, down here that the buyers came in. It may have been above it, but it wouldn't be to such an exacting level. This would have had a better low. It wouldn't have been to such an exacting level. This profile yesterday would have been more elongated. 
these profiles, attempted direction up would have been more elongated, volume would have been increasing on these days. Profiles would have been more elongated. Now yesterday, you said, well, yesterday was elongated, but I'll tell you, it was too elongated. And that's usually a sign of forcing action. So when I look at this, I look and I see the odds of substantial upside continuation have decreased, and the odds of a reversal someplace in the fairly near future are high. Does it have to happen? Of course not. But you see, and let's go to the let's go to the market here. And I'm going to put the overnight in back in here for a second. I seriously doubt that if that market had any better structure, I seriously doubt that this market would have broken this low overnight, all the way back down into the fat part of yesterday's profile. And what did it do? It did that when oil was coming down a little bit. Now we open the market and oil starts up, and again, that's what traders are looking at. They're following, they're following crude oil. But, and those things will happen. And one of the reasons I think they're happening, and people have heard me, that are clients, have heard me for months saying that I have not seen an indication of serious money or institutional money being on either the buy side or the sell side of the current market for some period of time. Remember, we've been moving sideways for 18, 19 months now. I have seen an awful lot of trading and some pretty big swings, but I haven't seen serious money. I've seen a lot of trading money, and that trading money can be very volatile, and that's what we've had, a lot of volatility. But I don't see any commitment by the longer-term time frames, either on the buy side or the sell side. They're fairly complacent. When that happens, and again, if we had more of that, we wouldn't have the volume, that low volume that we had. If we had really good money buying in these in these few days, we wouldn't have had decreasing volume in here. So a lot of trading money, trading money is very emotional, and what you have to appreciate, the trading money can turn around on you very, very quickly. Okay, I mean, I don't have a lot more to say that there's so much to learn about markets and there's this can the, the things that we're talking about can be used can be used for any time frame you want to trade let's go back to today's market for a second part of the things that we that we teach in the intensive and the intensive starts April 4th, for those that might have an interest, starts on April 4th. In the meantime, what we're doing is we're doing these, these are free educational webinars, you know, to introduce people to what we do. But also, as soon as people sign up, they're getting the two reports we put out each day. We put a report out at the end of each day uh, that kind of recaps the day and looks forward to tomorrow. And in the morning, we update that report. Then throughout the day, I do some limited chatting and to give you some kind of market comments um, on what we're really seeing on a short-term basis. So this information can be used on a short-term basis. It can be used on the longest of basis. For example, when we looked at the intermediate term low at the 1800 level, didn't go through it, the, the auction turns to the upside. That's a pretty powerful piece of information if you're doing longer-term trading. Um, and the volume is a pretty good indicator. If you're doing longer term trading, say, you know, it's suspect that this market's got a lot left in it. Now, on a day time frame basis, trading is about change. Without change, the market's going to continue what it was doing. So yesterday's market was based, was broken down into two separate distributions. The upper distribution, and we treat each distribution as a separate day or auction. So this morning, the market comes down, and 
it's basically at the low of that upper distribution. It's a very mechanical reference. So that's why I would classify this as a weak low because it was so exacting. In other words, the money that came in to buy this morning more than likely was weaker money, not money that's cut weak, that has what we call staying power or sticky money. They don't come in at exactly these levels. Who comes in exactly these levels? Short-term traders. Now that doesn't mean that short-term traders can't take the market a long way, but these are the traders that will reverse positions very quickly. So we treat each one of these distributions as a separate day or auction. We could not get below this distribution, so we the market the market showed no change relative to late yesterday afternoon. You're still it's still going higher. Do I like the market in here? No, I don't. But if there was anything here, you're going to trade to the downside. So we can trade to the downside or to the upside and say, okay, I've got a reference. I understand what the short-term traders are doing. And we talk about, during the intensive, we talk about not only our personal psychology, what helps us pull the trigger and understand the markets, but also the psychology of those that we are competing against. The psychology of those we are competing against, which I think are short-term traders, they're buying exact levels. They're buying exact levels down there, and you'll see that even the, the uh, early, I wrote a, a, a chat just before we started the uh, in uh, the uh, webinar this afternoon, and I said that yesterday's high was support. Looking, understanding the nature these people are competing against. The market comes down after I wrote that. E period takes goes one tick, one tick below yesterday's high. So that was the support. But one more time, when we're that if that actually does figure into odds-based thinking, because one more time this tells me more mechanical buying right at this level. It helps me understand who am I competing against. I am competing against short-term traders, and I know that they can reverse positions very, very quickly. And but that's information that we're looking at on a minute-by-minute -minute basis in here. So there's something we look at the very long term, we look at the very short term. We took a trend. What's today's trend is up. Today's trend is up. I'm going to split this out. Since the second period, the market is one time framing higher. We talked about balance. There's an inside bar said balance can be a 30-minute bar. It can be two overlapping bars. There's balance. We came out of balance, and it's another leg to the upside. Balance and excess, the two most important concepts we deal with. As of right now, you know, we're, we're, uh, uh, we, we have another inside bar building. The, the market's only a few, few minutes old for this time period. We go over and we say, let's understand what's going on. Well, you've had a little setback in crude oil, but crude oil, Crude oil has a weak high. So I don't know if crude poor. oil is done for the day. Poor high. I'm sorry. It's a poor high. And but it's you know, it's just stopped one time framing a couple times. So it's more than likely we're going to get some setback in crude before the day is over. It's poor up here. It stopped one time framing twice, which are things we look at to say it's getting very old. So again, no matter what time frame you're looking at. We address all of it because we live in the in the real world. Anyhow, Julia, let me take a couple of questions before we wind this up. Yes, please. On the S and P's, um, your blue chart would be much better if you just hit ESM six on that because the white chart doesn't have the regular template for today, and it's harder to see. Um, RV's asking E period today went one tick below the regular trading hours, the pit high from yesterday too. That is another weak reference, correct? Uh, e period went what? Yeah, that's what I just got done saying just a minute okay. ago. All right. I'm no, I just, yeah, I just got I'm done saying it. Question, so. okay. Yes, because I, I put a chat out, and I, the chat I put out said that this was support. Uh, that was you know before this happened. And then we came down. We look one tech below it. Yes, that's another mechanical reference that tells us who are we competing against. 
so the odds of being long, yes, we're going higher, but the odds of being long are kind of stacked against you, although it hasn't changed yet. But understand it could give way very quickly. Okay? Do you try to, Richard's asking, do you try and access odds of the length of time that poor structure or weak references may be revisited? And I, I know someone else asked this uh, similarly, you know, which may lead to you using options versus futures to facilitate uh, a bias. Yeah, so, it's hard. Remember, part of the thing, you, you can have a market going up and uh, and I may say, the risk is exponential. For example, what I wrote last night was the risk was exponential, and of course we got the correction. We got a big move overnight, so it actually did work. But when I'm looking at these things going up, like here's a point of control that should be revisited sometime in the future, and you say, well, how long do you carry that forward? I carry it forward until it's clear that we're not, that something has drastically changed and we're not coming back to, to that. Um, one of the, it's, there's an, another offset, and that is a lot of times if the market's going up, it's, and it doesn't have a good high, then you say the current auction is not completed. So that's, remember we started with trends, so the most important thing I look at are trends. And if the trend is not completed, so I've got either, you know, a long-term, a day time frame, or a short-term trend to the upside, it's not completed. That certainly figures into my um, my thinking. And then sometimes what happens, maybe the market's going up, and the, the things below it tell me that the market's basically fairly weak, but it's not completed. So sometimes what you'll see is the market will go up, it will complete, it will complete the auction, and then all of a sudden the market turns and comes down very quickly. So sometimes it's the order in which things happen. And you'll see us write a lot of times that there doesn't look to be, we don't like the market, but there doesn't look to be completion to the upside or doesn't look to be completion to the downside, you know, et cetera. Um, okay, other questions? What information or structure, et cetera, do you look at in order to exit a trade? Thanks, Dave. It's you're, you're looking at a combination of volume. One of the things we didn't talk about because it wasn't part of this, we're looking at tempo a lot of times. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the other morning, we were doing a webinar the other morning. The market gapped lower, and one of the things we wrote, the gap trading rules, and we wrote that the best the best example of where to put your short out is an attempt to fill the gap that fails. And what you see a lot of times on that failure is you see tempo become very slow. So in that point in time, the short took place, and we were on the webinar. We said, this is probably the place. Here's where you put your stop. And that's not what we're about, but that worked, but the tempo was slow. Okay, So that is not an exit. Well, it could have been an exit if you were long. That would have been an exit. If you were looking for a short, that might have been a place to go short. But let me give you, so tempo is very important. When a market, and again, your time frame, but a lot of times when you see the market, tempo get very low. Let me give you an example. Yesterday afternoon, the J period market rallied and it broke all the way down to the fat part of the profile in the that was built up in the morning. The market stopped on a dime here. Tempo on the downside just dried up. And that was your sign. That was your sign. That was your exit of short, and that was your sign along if that's what you wanted to do. But the market came down, came down hard, and all of a sudden it just looked like somebody put the brakes on it, stopped right here. Tempo dried up considerably. So tempo is one of the things that I that I use. Uh, decreasing volume is one of the things that I use. But you know, you, you have to be fairly well in touch with the, what a market's doing and the trend for the feeling for that particular day. Um, okay. With regard to price moving to value or value following price, can you describe what would look what it would look like today and how you monitor for that? Thanks. Okay, well, today is 
This was the top, this was the high of yesterday's value area right there. Okay? Market opens down here and the, it starts moving higher. So price is moving higher. Price is moving above value. So this is a trend day. On a trend day, price leads value. So if the less time you spend within yesterday's value, the greater the odds are that value is going to be higher today. And so that is one thing. Time, remember, price advertises opportunity, time regulates the opportunity, and value measures the success or failure of the opportunity. So as this market time spent above here and it's one time frame higher, the chances are pretty good, pretty good that the time spent up here that value is going to be higher today. So that's kind of what I'm, it's thinking about time and what's going on in the market um, that you're always looking for. So in this case, that price move first and value um, value follows. Okay, let me let me talk for just a second about, I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon, okay? One, this was exacting right down here, right to the bottom of yesterday. Are we one time framing higher? Yes. Remember the pullback in E period was exacting. The market, a lot of single prints, very strung out, very strung out again. B, this is one of those days because of how the structure, how strung out this market is. This is one of those days when I'm talking about, it may not break, but when I talk about the risk of being long being very high. And that's what I see. So it may not give any, any more back, but I'm saying so when I see this kind of structure, the risk of being high is very long. With this exactness down to these levels, it is an indication to me that I've got the weakest hands, traders, are long in this market. And they're following. I, I bet you I can look over here, and I'm going to see that crude has softened, and that's why the market's soft. Sure, crude has come down a bit on the market softening. So this market's not trading on its own. Very dangerous, very, very dangerous situation in the market. Now, this is a trend day. The market on a trend day very often stops one time framing once. If the market starts one time framing once, that allows inventory to get back into balance, then the market turns back to the upside on a day like this. That is a, a trend day, you know, and we haven't stopped one time framing since B period, so you got two scenarios here. The market may stop one time framing and then bring some short-term inventory back into balance, and then the market continues back to the upside after balance has been, you know, has been brought back into something reasonable. Or if, and we're going to use this just we've got three dis one distribution, two distributions, three distributions. We've got three distributions, so we are very, very strung out today. Usually a sign of very emotional buying. So we're going to use this D period high is going to be if we close or merge these distributions, that's a pretty significant pullback. I then look down the lower right-hand corner. It's 1214. I know the time change is coming in 16 minutes. I look to see now on the next 30-minute bar, do we start to one time frame lower or do we start to move back up? If I start to one time frame lower or I stop one time framing, twice, that's usually a sign of quite a bit of weakness. Overall, I think the risk of being high today is very big. Uh, questionable low, we came back to one tick below our support level, mechanical buying, very strung out, three distributions. We'll see what happens as the day goes on. But it's still trading off of another market, which is also very weak. Okay, a final couple questions. Yes, given the market is up on a weak foundation and the odds have increased for retracement, how would Jim enter a short position as price continues to go higher? Does Jim use a structural reference, monitor how trading occurs at that reference, and then decide whether to enter the short or not? I would like to hear Jim's thinking on position entry. Okay. I, on, a, on a market like this, number one, I don't use futures. Uh, simply because I know the volatility and I, when I see it trading off of another market, uh, if I'm putting on anything for any period of time, 
I'm probably going to use options so I don't get forced out at night. So I would be buying buying puts in there. And and sometimes they're all at once, sometimes they're scaled up. Uh, you know, I have scaled I have scaled into this market with puts a little bit because I don't like it. But there's no ex I have no exact formula other than I seldom use futures if I'm going to be taking a trade home overnight because I'm looking for something more significant. Just because I just what goes on in the overnight markets uh, can take you out of a position that you didn't want to be out of. The other thing is the options give me an opportunity. I can trade against the options. So if I had puts the market broke, I have an opportunity to go long against those puts with futures for a you know for a rally. Um, and that can make that can you know that can allow me to trade within a within a trend because markets don't go directionally in one in one way. Okay, now we're looking at this current market. And as we you do, do have a, just pardon, pardon me, sir, pardon me. Um, can you talk about tempo route now and H period? Just as you're talking about it, can you get Mike's question answered? Yeah, tempo is we're we we've come out. We're we're one time framing lower um, on the market, and the tempo doesn't seem overly aggressive on the downside, but it's pretty it's pretty steady. So right now it's pretty steady. I'm looking at this deep period high. I know that the market is very long for this morning, so um, we're more than likely in a liquidation phase. But tempo is moderate right now, but it's steady. It's steady. There's no indication um, that it's given up. And when you get something like this, it's not uncommon to have it be a little slow to begin with and then speed up as uh, the longs get shaken out of their position. Okay, final question. Well, I have two to combine here, and I, you may have answered it so we can move on. I'm just typing in answers so I don't hear everything. Is the market overly long now, or is the short covering dominant? I think the market, the market is overly long now. That would be my assessment. And remember, you still have quadruple witching tomorrow, and you have an options expiration that takes – the, the uh, the futures go off the board at the opening tomorrow. The options go off the board, I think, an hour before the opening or someplace in that area. So you got, you know, a lot of strange things can happen on a day like this and quadruple witching. But, yes, I think the market is overly long. And it combined with that, as you've heard us, people that have been with us heard us say, short covering very often can weaken a market because it removes potential buying power from that, uh, from that market. But this over this market overall, me to me, appears to be overly long with weaker hands traders, as evidenced by the exactness of this low, the exactness of this pullback. And when I see that, I know I'm not dealing with longer institutional type money, meaning money that you know is willing to stay around for a while. Okay. Okay. Um, is the market made up of mostly short covering? When you are, or he says only. Pardon me. Um, what, pardon. what goes on? And and this is one of the things. It can be very confusing to short-term traders. Most of the most of the client base we have are either day or short-term traders. Within that time frame of trading, day and short-term, what you'll find is inventory consistently gets too long, then it gets too short. Gets too long, gets too short. Let me go back and spread out yesterday. And it, but this is extremely confusing to a lot of people. You know, the market, in the morning, the market opens and it goes up and it moves sideways for three, four, five, look at all this period of time. And when I'm looking at this, I'm saying, their market's going up and the, the longs, they're buying every break. C period break, they buy it. D period, E period break, they buy it. They're getting longer and longer and longer. And that's the very short term time frame. They're, they would price in the morning. And really, to be successful as a trader, you have to understand and get a feel for this. That this is inventory, it's getting longer and longer and longer. Very short term inventory. Bang. Then you get the liquidation break. And the liquidation break goes down very quickly takes out the early morning range, then the market's back to the upside. So the market, the daytime frame inventory got too long. Oh, once it broke, everybody jumped over it, it got too short, and then you start moving to the upside. Now, this was following 
crude oil, like I say, I think yesterday that the uh, the Fed meeting uh, put interest rate rise on delay. I think that hurt the dollar. I think that really kicked the uh, uh, crude into effect, and I think you got an awful lot of emotional buying in that market. But when you look, I put the overnight up, and you saw a big break overnight in the market because inventory got too long. And let me put the overnight back up again because I'll show you what I think happened here. Um, I'm going to collapse yesterday in a minute. Okay, the same principle is overnight. This inventory getting too long and too short. It happens overnight too. Overnight, crude goes up and the market gets really, really long. Then look at this liquidation. One, two, three, four, five, five periods. They just crush this market. They take care of the overnight longs, and they probably go from all the way of being too long overnight to getting the market too short, and you come back up again. It's one of the things that makes short-term trading very difficult is understanding that there's so many times when inventory gets too long, too short, too long, too short, and if you don't appreciate that that's what's going on, you have a tendency to start to see meaningful moves either up or down when all you are looking at is an inventory adjustment. All right, uh, one final question and then we'll say thank you. Uh, before we sign off, if there's anything on the downside here, look in the lower right-hand corner. It's 12.22. Time's going to change in eight minutes. We have stopped one time framing, one period. When we change time periods, if there's anything here, we will continue. We'll, you know, the next period will take out the H period low. We'll get back into this lower distribution. And if, we, if that doesn't happen, more than likely, all we're looking at in this break in H period is just a correction to daytime frame inventory. Once that inventory is corrected, then the market can move higher again. So it's going to be very important. That's why I look at the time, seven minutes, constantly. Final question, please. Yes, from Lydia. Um, she wants to know again, can you describe or give the definition of a completed auction so we can get that clear before we sign off for everyone? Excess. Excess marks the end of one auction and the beginning of another auction. And that can be a daytime frame auction. That's It can be, you know, this auction is have potential to be completed. There's two ticks of excess. This auction can be completed. There's two ticks of excess. Remember, it's a continuous two-way auction process. We auction from low to high, high to low. We auction to the lows. We auction to the highs, high, still auctioning higher balance, still auctioning higher. Up. Ah, now we're trying an auction to the downside. So it's, it's a constant, continuous two-way auction process. But usually there's excess marking the end of one auction, the beginning of another auction. My early example, I have questions if the intermediate term auction is really over at the 1800 level because of such limited excess at that level. All right, thank you once again. Uh, we'll be back on here, what, next Tuesday? And, yep. um, and I'm hoping that uh, many of you will join us if you haven't already for our um, the final intensive I will be giving that starts April 4th. Uh, the earlier you get signed up, the, f the more time we have to condition you to a lot of the concepts that we are dealing with throughout this uh, final intensive. Thank you very, very much. Okay, great. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, don't forget, this is being recorded. You can go to jdaltontrading.com, resources, webinars, recorded webinars, and we'll have it up for you a little later today. Okay, so thanks again, everyone, for being here. We'll see you next Tuesday. Be well. Bye-bye.